Welcome, it's Sunday, that means it's time for another triple threat video here on OTRS Central. How it works, I talk about three separate topics for maybe one to three minutes each, just give you my random rambling thoughts, and then you have the chance, obviously, to comment, chime in, and let me know what you think about what I've said and the topics that I've discussed. And yes, in the future, I'm going to be doing this where other YouTubers are going to be able to do their segments in this Triple Threat video series, and that's going to be coming up very soon. And if you want to take part in it, I'll put the information in the description box on what you need to do to be able to take part in it. So let's go triple threat time, baby. There have been some reports recently talking about the WWE maybe cooling off on Cesaro a little bit and not maybe being as hot on him as they were maybe once heading into WrestleMania season or at WrestleMania time. And I don't think you really need any reports, frankly, to see that this is clearly the case. The WWE has clearly cooled off on Cesaro. You go from having him split with the Real Americans and win the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, then for some dumb dick reason you associate him with Paul Heyman. And remind me again, people, how did that benefit Cesaro in any way, shape, or form? Exactly, it fucking didn't. And now you look, over the past few weeks, he's lost to Kofi Kingston a couple times. Now he's lost to Big E Langston. I don't even give a damn if he does win the Intercontinental Championship. It still doesn't really mean all that much for Cesaro, and it definitely doesn't mean that the WWE is hot on him and trying to make him this big-time star. And my whole problem with this is... It's like the WWE has a rule against making a bunch of stars at once. It's like they have a total unwillingness to sit there and elevate multiple guys at the same time, which I find completely ridiculous. Well, they're cooling off on Cesaro because maybe they're prioritizing Reigns and Ambrose and Rollins. It's great that you're emphasizing and prioritizing Reigns and Ambrose and Rollins and maybe a Bray Wyatt as well. That's a good thing. It's something your product desperately needs, and it's something we as a fan base definitely want. But where is it written in the wrestling rule book or in the sports entertainment rule book that you can't try everything possible to make Cesaro a freaking star too? Why sit there and make four guys future big time players and stars when you can make five, six, eight, or nine? I mean, let's look back at the company's history during the Attitude Era and even the build up to the Attitude Era. Between the time frames of, let's say, 1997 and 2000. Here are the different stars that the WWE made in the WWE way. Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock, Triple H, Mankind, Big Show, Kurt Angle, and Kane. And then you had all these other stars on the periphery, the mid-card guys, the tag teams, the factions. I could go on and on and on. If you took the WWE's philosophy of today and you applied it to that period back then, you would have maybe gotten Austin and The Rock, and those would have been the only two fucking stars that they really would have tried to develop or make better. Why? Why would you sit there and restrict yourself? Why would you sit there and handicap yourself? Why would you sit there and limit yourself on the number of potential big stars that you can make? Why in the fuck can't you make Cesaro a star at the same time that you're making a Roman Reigns, a Seth Rollins, a Dean Ambrose, a Bray Wyatt, and maybe a couple other individuals into stars too? This makes absolutely no sense to me. And all the while, what ends up happening is it seems like the WWE are like a bunch of six-year-old kids. They don't want anybody else playing with their fucking toys. But when they get bored with them, they're they're done with them, and they don't care about them. It's stupid. I've been pleasantly pleased with TNA over the past several weeks. They've been improving. They've been getting better. And, you know, this makes me feel a little more optimistic about the company's direction for the rest of 2014, most notably heading into Bound for Glory. And I guess my whole thing is, is I'm kind of starting to look ahead, and that's just something that I have a tendency to do, and I try to look forward and envision where a company can go, where the creative direction might go, who's going to be where and when. And I'm just thinking about Bound for Glory, and I'm wondering who should win the TNA title at Bound for Glory. Now, I'm not here to necessarily give a definitive answer. I'm just here to kind of float out the subject and kind of get your thoughts on it, too, and maybe present you with a few options. Since you're in Tokyo, Japan, would it make some sense to maybe have Sonata win the TNA World Heavyweight Championship, seeing as how the WWE you know, just signed Kenta to a developmental deal and he's going to be in the fold, why can't TNA sit there and say, well, you've got Kenta and that's phenomenal and that's great, but we've got a Japanese guy in Tokyo wrestling in the main event for the title and having him win the title in Tokyo, everybody wins, especially TNA. WWE's got their guy in developmental, we've got our guy at the top of the company. 
you know, maybe there's something there to that. Uh, maybe it should be Bobby Roode. You know, I'm looking at a guy here that to me now has become the franchise piece for TNA. And to me, if you want to appeal to TNA fans, there are a few better men you could have at this point be that world champion than Bobby Roode. You know, some people might sit there and say because of his notoriety, his work over the years, his work in Japan, that maybe with especially him going into the Hall of Fame, maybe you'd put a Bully Ray in that spot as a baby face against a heel. And maybe you could and maybe it would work. But again, do you really need to go down that avenue again? Some people might say a Jeff Hardy. But again, you know, at some point in time, do these guys start to bring you a diminishing return every time you try and push them to the top and make them into a top guy? And if you said, well, if a Kurt Angle was healthy by that time, maybe you would put him there. And you know, Kurt Angle is a type of talent that could pretty much main event any TNA pay-per-view and it would get over and work to a degree. However, again, similar to a Bully Ray and Jeff Hardy, you're ultimately, in my opinion, pushing another company's former top guy to the top of your company, which if any way sits there and makes it seem like you're second rate. And then you could sit there and say Samoa Joe, and this is, again, somebody that would appeal very much to the TNA fans, like a freaking Bobby Roode would. You know, and maybe with some work over in Japan, Samoa Joe has a familiarity, and maybe he would work too, and it would be kind of like a nice uh, feeling for the product. It would be a nice feeling for the fans of TNA. I said, I'm not really sure. It's hard to, for me to envision a direct path for anybody at this point in time. I'm just wondering who you think should win the title at Bound for Glory. So the big bombshell, it wasn't really, I guess, a bombshell this week, is that the WWE officially moved CM Punk to the alumni section of WWE.com. And I think they also removed his merchandise from the website because he's no longer under contract with the company. And CM Punk even, I think, took to Twitter to uh, address this situation at least a little bit. Now, finally, after almost six damn months, can those of you that are still holding on and hanging on to hope admit once and for all that this is not a work that CM Punk has actually done? CM Punk is gone from the WWE. Can we admit that now? Can we acknowledge that now? You know, and I understand that this still aggravates a lot of you. This still pisses a lot of you off, and I can't blame you. I mean, I understand it because you're talking about CM Punk who is the rare entertaining guy in, frankly, a not very entertaining era. And for so many of you, he was your favorite guy. And it makes it a lot harder to get excited about the WWE product when your favorite wrestler, your favorite guy in the company, is no longer there. And a lot of you maybe transitioned over to Daniel Bryan, but at the end of the day, Daniel Bryan's Daniel Bryan, but Daniel Bryan is not CM Punk. Sorry, Daniel Bryan fans, that's the truth. And when you look at CM Punk, you know, to me, I have my knocks against him for leaving and conducting himself the way that he did. But I also say this, and maybe some other wrestlers in the WWE should take note of what CM Punk did. After so many years of working and so many years of doing it, he created a situation where he didn't need it anymore. And he didn't have to do it anymore. And that was his leverage that he could exercise. He didn't have the leverage of going to a WCW or doing anything like that. He had the leverage of, hey, you know what? Pick up my ball and go home. I don't have to put up with this shit anymore. And I'm sure all of us in our own ways in the real world wish we could do that. Unfortunately, you should also learn from the WWE standpoint that nobody is bigger with, than the company. And they sure as hell are not going to kiss CM Punk's ass. Now, I hope at some point in time that cooler heads can prevail. And I'll say this. Never say never in professional wrestling. For those of you that sit there and believe that CM Punk is gone forever, I don't think he's gone forever. Because I look at it and I say Stone Cold Steve Austin picked up his ball and went home. He came back. Brock Lesnar left the company. Eight years later, he came back. Batista left in 2010. Almost four years later, he came back. I have to believe that at some point in time, CM Punk is going to get the itch again. CM Punk is going to get the rub again, the desire again, to at least work one last run and go out his way in the WWE. Now, I could be wrong. But CM Punk fans, just stay patient. I think at some point in time, your straight-edge savior will be back in the WWE. In the meantime, stop fucking chanting his name!
Well, I want to hear from you. What are your thoughts on the WWE cooling off on Cesaro? Do you agree with them? Do you think it's stupid? Who do you think should be the TNA World Heavyweight Champion after Bound for Glory and why? And your thoughts on it finally being official that CM Punk is no longer employed by the WWE. Let me hear from you in the comments below.